Here. Councilmember Farmer. Councilmember McCutcheon. Here. Councilmember Rambo. Here. Councilmember Flasher. Here. Councilmember Galani. And Chair Bartoni. Here. Thank you. Um, first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the November 16th um, committee meeting. Do I see a motion to approve the minutes? Okay, I've got one from Council Member Nyan. Teresa, did you second it by chance? Yes, seconded by Council Member Clark. Any questions or discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, minutes have been approved. That takes us to public input. Um, I see we do have a couple attendees, one of which is Joe Farmer. So whoever's driving, whoever has the keys, if they can move him over. And if Mr. Garitano has anything to say for public input, we would do so at this point. Otherwise, it doesn't look like we will have any public input. Just here to watch. Slow news day for Joe. All right. So that takes us to action items. Uh, we have four under planning matters. We have six under park matters. And we do have an executive session scheduled for tonight. So we've got a full schedule. So we'll get started with the first item under planning matters is consideration of revised sound analysis of State Route 100 and State Route 109 corridors. Joe, I think you're gonna take this one. Yes, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, as you'll recall, through much of 2021 last year, this committee spent a great deal of time talking about noise or sound, depending on your perspective. They are, I guess, two different things. Ultimately, the committee defined six items of importance. And one of those items was the noise levels along the major arterial corridors of State Route 100 and State Route 109. Many of you may recall during ward meetings where those two corridors are located, there were complaints about increased noise, particularly late at night from certain types of motorcycles or vehicles. So ultimately, the committee decided that a analysis of those corridors would be beneficial. To assist in that, acoustical associates, Dr. Tom Thunder and his son, Steve, were asked to submit a proposal, which was ultimately recommended by the committee and then approved for implementation by city council. Over the course of the summer, Acoustical Associates did, an, uh, did a visit to Wildwood and then ultimately created an analysis for consideration. The analysis was provided to the committee for initial comments and those comments were then submitted back to Acoustical Associates. Tonight you have what I consider the fourth draft of the report. Some of the items that have been identified, not only by the committee, but internally here with city personnel have been addressed. And there were additional comments that were raised relative to the analysis, the last one, the third draft. And tonight, Dr. Thunder was intending to be here along with his son, Steve, to basically respond to those questions and address the desired additional work that I think it will be required but there is an illness in his family that's unfortunately kind of serious. And so tonight he was unavailable. I had confirmed him in early December, but he intends to be here in February. So tonight we do have the responses to the questions that were raised at the November, 2021 meeting. I sent those out via email yesterday to all of you. And we do have the updated report. I think it's important to note that the roundabout at Pongrover Parkway and Route 109 was not one of the locations that had 
on-site microphone testing, nor has it been part of the modeling to extract data for noise levels in that vicinity. That can be done, and certainly Dr. Thunder makes note of that as part of it. Also, Dr. Thunder has identified that the ramp areas can be reevaluated, and those were another area of concern. So I think the responses to the questions are anything that the committee would like to investigate further or add can be done, and certainly would be, you know, Acoustical Associates would be glad to assist the city based upon the ten tenure of the responses. So from that perspective, I think we have some information that's new and certainly we can discuss that. And if there's any comments or questions, I can forward them to Dr. Thunder so he can be prepared for the February meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, any questions for the department from anyone? Okay, seeing, oh, well, go ahead, Teresa, go ahead. I yeah, thank you. Deborah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment since a lot of this is in Ward 1, um, not all of it, but um, the, the, the report does tell us a lot if we look at the details of it and has had some corrections made to it. So um, it's uh, more understandable at this point. Um, the the data that was taken on three locations, just so we're, we're, we point that out, that we have data from three locations. That data we did ask for, I don't see it. I see some data discussion like uh, graphs, but I don't see the data listed. And I think someone had asked for that data. Um, the three locations were location seven, eight, and nine. And from that data, you know, extracted data, is not how I learned to do things because now we've got all of this um, computerized ways of extracting data. So um, the extracted data is only as good as the model, but looking at the model that they've developed, um, it looks like he's gone over you know, all the important details with the, the um, topographic features, the adjacent buildings and um, acoustical focus effects that are around the area as well as extraneous noise, which is really important. And to calculate that in um, meteorologically, he's um, included wind speed and temperature in his calculation. So it, it looks really um, like a good model. So I think that we can use, in my opinion, and using the, he also used the um, information from the not only from the traffic study, but from the um, Missouri Department of Transportation, I believe is their um, study in 2019 on traffic in that area. So based on all of those things, the, um, the report looks really good to me at this point. Thank you for, thank you, Teresa. Deborah, go ahead, please. Um, I agree with Teresa. I, I think the report is um, well done. My my concern again, as you all know, is the questions that I had before, which was the um, study at the roundabout around Pond Grover Parkway. Um, residents have been complaining about the noise level at that for some time. Had originally asked for that portion to be part of the study. I'm not quite sure how that fell through the cracks. Um, also know that um, council member Garantano Residents also had concerns at uh, Canberry and that roundabout. So I didn't see that in the study either. Is that there, Joe? Or Ms. McCutcheon, uh, yes, one of the uh, actual microphone locations is number eight, which is in the vicinity of Canberry. But again, as part of a response to one of the questions, I believe one of your questions is, they will do a reevaluation of some of the ramp areas that would be particularly important for the Canberry location. So um, I'd like to make a motion that we go ahead and have the study include the roundabout at Pond Grover Parkway and then also um, the ramp areas.
Thank you, Deborah. Um, Joe, was that going to be, was he, was, you know, Dr. Thunder coming back to do that already, or do we need a motion to have him come back and do that? Um, Mr. Chair, I would prefer a motion in the event that there is some charge associated with it. At least I can say that there is support. And then Mr. Cross, Ms. Ripito, and I can make the decision how we present it back to you in terms of the cost and the information. So yes, a motion would be fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Deborah. And we need a second to that motion. Seconded by Council Member Farmer. Thank you, Joe. So any discussion on the motion to, like, I guess, proceed with further sound analysis? Is that fair enough, Deborah? Yeah, and uh, specifically the roundabouts at um, Pound, Grover, Pound Grover Parkway and then the um, ramp areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, Teresa, go ahead, please. Uh, Tracy was before me. Oh, I'm sorry. Tra I saw Tracy's hand up, but I was kind of doing a coin flip as to which one was first. So Tracy, go ahead and I'll come back to you, Teresa. I just had a question. If we vote for seed, are we voting to do this no matter the cost or will the cost come back to us to decide for it? Ms. Diane, I would never say proceed without cost in mind. So if it's in keeping with the 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 amount that we've already expended for the initial study and the drafts we've received, I think we could probably proceed. But if it's substantially more, certainly we would hold off to the next committee meeting. Thank you. Teresa, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the, um, the study that on those two locations, if they the locations meet with Dr. Thunder's um, uh, guidelines on his extracted data, he can, he can pull that out and do the calculations without coming out and actually doing another uh, sound analysis. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Any other questions? Okay, so Joe, I have one, like, you know, with the, with the data we get back, what, what are we gonna do with it, really? I mean, it's, I don't mind doing this, but I can't imagine we're tearing out roundabouts or, you know, anything like that. So what are we, what's the end goal, end game here? Mr. Chair, certainly uh, there may be other opinions amongst uh, the committee members, but I believe it is the information, the evidence we need to continue to discuss with Missouri Department of Transportation that we need some type of sound mitigation, particularly in certain locations where the noise is problematic. And so to go to the, the Department of Transportation without, let's say, science in our favor, the likelihood of us being successful is slim, but at least if we have legitimate analysis and we have a case to present, I think at least we can start there. And as with anything, and I'm starting to fall back on this more and more, with all the federal money for infrastructure, this may be the opportune time to look at some options. Yeah, I would agree with that. And thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, so any other questions for the department? Okay, seeing none, we'll try to do this with a sound vote I think we can do. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, thank you everyone. So we'll look forward to the additional uh, information. Next on their planning matters is the overview of major options for fencing and associated permitting requirements for the city of Wildwood. Um, Joe, I think you and Melanie are gonna tag team this one. Yes, Mr. Chair, I just wanna again, identify that this particular item was at the November 2021 meeting of the committee. The committee wanted, uh, provided the department 60 days and then on at the end of that 60 days wanted some type of report back. Ms. Ripito worked for the city of town and country um, several years ago and the city of town and country has fence regulations. And so she was a perfect candidate to kind of tackle this item for the committee and I'll turn it over to her, so thank you. 
Good evening. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Um, I, I have quite a bit of experience dealing with fence regulations and Wildwood um, does have very little um, as far as fence regulations are concerned. Um, the city currently only regulates fences that are over six feet in height outside of town center or unless they're otherwise specified in a site specific ordinance. Um, subdivisions do regulate fencing through their indentures um, and they can be more restrictive than the cities. Uh, however, the city sets basically the minimum standard as far as the regulations are concerned. Um, at the request of the committee, the department has researched other city's fence regulations and um, provided a chart included in your packet that shows different characteristics of fencing frequently found or different characteristics of um, fences frequently found in regulations um, and a list of potential options for changes. One of the most consider or one of the most important considerations would be how much does the city want to regulate fences? This process could be as simple as including some safety regulations, such as not allowing fences within a site distance triangle and requiring front yard fences to be a certain height or material for visibility issues um, or distance from the street. Um, so as not to cause any issues, or they can be as detailed as regulating the style, height, color, materials, or location on a lot. It's important to determine exactly what the city is looking for uh, when writing fence regulations. I did actually include an excerpt from town and countries just to demonstrate how they address their concerns with privacy or stockade fences. They were uh, very concerned with keeping that open country feel. And although they have large lots relative to uh, St. Louis County, they're not quite as large as many of the lots in Wildwood. And so, you know, it's just determining how and where you want fences to be allowed and visibility through them and, and of course, dealing with safety issues. Uh, because fences have such an impact on both the character and the safety of a neighborhood, tonight the department is seeking guidance from the committee on the extent of, of the proposed regulations. Once the changes are identified, new regulations can be developed by the city attorney and the Department of Planning for presentation to the city council. Uh, we would also be happy to bring that product back before the committee, before it goes to council, if, if you wish. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Mr. Vunich and I, of course, are here for any questions and would love to hear your input on, on what you know, the city would like to regulate and not regulate as far as fences are concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Rob, go ahead, please. Sure, I'll start this off. There's, um, uh, I, um, Wildwood in, in general, well, especially out west here, is uh, is more rural than town and country, and than Webster and other places. And so um, we have a we have some different needs. My personal concern with the any fence regulations is if it's over six feet it's a considered a structure and it has all these special requirements. And um, I'm concerned because a deer fence has to be seven feet. And there are folks who are interested in, in, in having, you know, protecting, um, you know, parts of their landscape from the, the predations of the, of the deer overpopulation. So we need to solve that a little bit differently, probably than a more a suburban type of area, but I think this started because there was some heartburn and grief over the um, over one particular fence out here. Uh, aesthetically, it wasn't um, uh, it wasn't um, what some folks wanted to see. It I personally didn't have any problem with it whatsoever. But I, I think um, Melanie was right on about um, maybe just starting with some safety concerns and so forth and provide some simple aesthetic guidelines, particularly uh, privacy fences, as, as she mentioned. I, I, don't, I don't care for pri privacy fences and they do, um, they do change the character of an area. So um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, what I'm saying right now is less is more probably ought to be our uh, approach. That's just my, uh, my personal opinion. So I'll be interested to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you, Rob. Teresa, go ahead, please. 
I have some of the same ideas as Rob. Um, I, I did have a little bit of problem with that, that fence that he was talking about though. But um, a couple of things that I would like to make sure we have on there is um, one are the substrate, one, uh, the substrate of the material used because some of the wood, treated wood is treated with um, chemicals, uh, something that's called Penta for short. And um, that is leaches into the, uh, the ground and into the water. And just so it, it and it's pentachlorophenol, if you want to write that down, but it's, um, it does leach into the, and it will kill um, a lot of our um, good, good um, <clears throat> tiny little things that are in the water. And um, as well, the maintenance of, of the fences, um, chemicals that are used on them to, can, to clean certain um, thermoplastic materials that are used in uh, the, the polymer type substrates. And my, I have a question though about the, um, the height of this fence. And will this be grandfathered if we did something like say that um, it has to, to be setback requirement for a, a certain height fence around a property that uh, butts to a road. Um, for example, there's a property at the southwest corner of um, Wild Horse Creek and um, 109 that has a fence that's right on the road almost. And what, what about these locations? Would we grandfather these or insist that they change right away? If we maybe... can really speak, sorry, sorry, my apologies. Um, if I may, um, generally speaking, when regulations change, um, existing fences would not need to be changed. Uh, you don't backdate regulations. Essentially, moving forward, all fences would have to meet the uh, current regulations, and. Um, and, and or if these fences were replaced, then they would have to uh, be brought up to code or they'd have to seek a variance. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Teresa, were you finished? Okay. Uh, Joe, go ahead, please. Joe Farmer. Yeah, um, so I know at least in our subdivision, you know, mo the vast majority of the questions I get as a trustee or approval or whatever is for fence stuff and our regulations exist, but they're relatively simple. So I, my assumption is that most of the kind of subdivisions that we have probably have some type of regulation. I would imagine, and, you know, Rob, you can maybe correct me if you know this or not, like I would imagine the folks out West that don't have associations are probably just sort of left completely to their own devices on what's going to happen. So I'm, I'm with Rob on the deer fence thing. I mean, I know at least in my subdivision, we've got a six foot limit. Um, I think the deer fence at seven feet, you know, that makes sense. I mean, maybe we can just do something as simple as like, if there aren't any regulations, the city can have a very limited amount saying if it's under whatever, eight feet, then, you know, here's sort of the look, um, you know, I know for us, chain link is not supposed to be allowed. There's a little bit of chain link throughout the neighborhood that was very old. But I mean, I, I would, I don't know that we want to have the city spending a huge amount of time regulating fences. I just, I'm not sure if it's like the world's biggest problem. We have certainly more important things to worry about than that. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I would be in favor of like a very limited guidance. Maybe we can, um, I, I don't know how it works if somebody, the city can, review or we can have subdivision trustees turn it in and just make sure it falls within a very bare minimum standard of what we're looking to do and then if it's outside of that just give the city a little bit of guidance on like if it's under eight feet please don't paint it pink or whatever i mean i just i think that some of this I, i'm I'm, I'm happy you guys did a lot of this work but some of this stuff just seems like a lot of effort for not a lot of return to me thank you joe any other questions at this point so I guess I have one, and I, whether this is for Joe, Melanie, or Steve Cross, but 
um, unless I miss it in the material, there wasn't anything that kind of defaulted back to HOAs. So I, you know, I know that we would not want to step on anyone's toes, but um, is there something, did I miss something or is that just like an assumed thing? Go ahead, Melanie. Thank you, Chair. Um, as far as as far as indentures and HOAs are concerned, the city technically has no right to enforce their regulations. Um, HOAs can have regulations that that surpass the cities, and that's it's essentially an agreement with the residents in the subdivision. Um, we as the city can't actually enforce them. Um, there are a lot of subdivisions that do regulate fences or don't allow fences at all. Uh, however, you know this this would be coming up with a minimum standard and HOAs can go beyond that um, in their regulations, but this would just be the minimum that fences have to meet if we determine fence regulations. Thank you. And then my next question was, and Teresa kind of alluded to this, or well, not kind of, she did. So, you know, she was talking about the different chemicals that are used to treat the wood or that are used in the plastic. Is there a way that the city would even be able to enforce that? Um, truth that be might told, not be a fair uh, question. I expect an answer. <laughs> like, so, I've I've had some experience with fence regulations and reviewed others, and I've never come across anything that that does regulate um, the chemicals in in the fences themselves or in the cleaning products used on fences, that would have to be something that we would have to research. I'm not sure how easily it could be enforced, um, you know, given that, you know, we see a fence, we don't know exactly um, or exactly what they're, you know, using it to clean. Um, essentially, it could be put in regulations. And if there was a way of proving otherwise, I mean, we could potentially enforce it, but I think that it, it could be challenging. Yeah, thank you. Um, Teresa, go ahead, please. Rob, I got you next. I think Rob was before me, but I'm gonna go ahead. He's he's very kind and will wait, I'm sure. Um, no, I, um, what about fences? Uh, you know, we sh it just seems like we should have some regulation on some fences I've seen that are very shabby. Um, I have one um, that I know of that I call the Gilligan's Island fence because <laughs> Mr. Bunnish knows which one I'm talking about because it's just like a bunch of boards up there that are old, uh, pe old wood that they've just tacked up to hide some other things that are behind them. So how do we... Um, how do we address those? That's kind of a fair question. Go ahead, Melanie. <laughs> um, if it's a matter of the fences being old and needing repair, I'm, those can be addressed with through code enforcement with like property maintenance um, uh, regulations. Uh, if it's just a matter of the type of materials that the fence is created with, uh, uh, at City of Manchester, for example, used you know, they limited the types of materials um, or just had prohibited materials um, uh, in their fence regulations. They also had, they limited the numbers of like the number of like types of fencing so that you didn't have, you know, four different types of fencing along one strip of land. Uh, they wanted it more consistent, cohesive. So there are ways of regulating things like that that we could look into. Thank you, Rob. Go ahead, and Deborah, I got you next. Sure. Yeah, just to, to circle back on the, the the deer fence thing. There's a particular type of of material that's uh, are, are, that's commonly used for deer fences. It's a welded wire, just in squares. Everybody's seen it. Squares are rectangles. Uh, quite often, it's um, smaller squares, um, um, uh, lower. And, you know, they exclude, you know, other smaller animals and so on and so forth, but it's, um, and then there's just posts. And so there's nothing really to it. They um, tend to disappear. And so I don't really think, I think a, a light touch on, on deer, uh, deer fence regulations is, 
uh, the, the right approach, but I wanted to also circle back to the, um, the treated lumber. I used to you know, work with treated lumber occasionally and um, the splinters would fester within a couple of days. It'd be really awful because it's such a terrible chemical, but they used to use arsenic um, a, 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 you know, some compound of arsenic. Now it's called ACQ. Um, for the most part, I think everything that Home Depot sells is considerably less toxic than it used to be. And um, I, I think we could um, we could certainly um, put you know the the more benign types of treated lumber in the um, in our ordinances without causing anybody any heartburn because they run to Home Depot they're going to get the, the among the least toxic um, you know types of of treatments anyway there are there used to be a movement for this is kind of off the subject but um, people wanted to make uh, wooden foundations like basements and so on and so forth with treated lumber and so they came up with ways that they could treat lumber and make it last you know 50 60 years. Um, but it comes at a cost of all the little critters that Teresa was talking about. I don't think we need to get, um, you know, too wound up in the, in the, um, in the toxicity of, of treated lumber, uh, unless we want to ban it completely, which wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be a wise move at all. So um, uh, get, getting back to the, the, the impetus behind this effort, um, it was um, aesthetic. I think the um, most of the the fences where we'll have aesthetic concerns are uh, covered by HOAs, and so I'm once again advocating for um, taking the um, taking the least intrusive approach to regulation and 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 uh, see where we can go with that. Melanie, I think you did uh, you put together a whole lot of data here, and um, it was a great effort. I would not like to see us um, be another town and country um, with tons of of fencing regulations. I just don't think it's warranted in Wildwood. Thank you, Rob. Deborah, go ahead, please. Um, so I, I know this is more work and you may know the answer to this, but um, HOAs do have fencing regulations and I don't know if it would even be worthwhile to take a look at those um, to see if you know we feel like those are adequate um, I, I'm with Rob. I really don't want to see us do a lot of fence regulation. Um, I don't know with HOAs if there are is guidance about uh, site distance and safety. If we're going to do anything, that would be my preference to address. Um, and it, I mean, is this based on one complaint or is there been multiple complaints um, about fencing? Um, you know, I, I, I'm with Rob. I think less regulation is better, but um, I'm always very pro-safety. Thank you, Deborah. And I, I mean, if anybody knows the answer, I mean, I know of one complaint that we heard about at a council meeting, um, and it wasn't from a resident, really. But, um, I'm, you know, I kind of set a time. I don't want to be where we're a problem. You know, I don't, I don't know if we really have a problem here, but does anybody know if we've had multiple complaints? Steve, do you know if we've had multiple complaints from residents? <clears throat> no, I am not aware, uh, Chair Bartoni, of um, multiple complaints. Uh, the city attorney and I are working on the one fencing issue that you all have alluded to. Uh, that, um, so we're working on that particular issue, but uh, that's the only <clears throat> that's the only issue I'm aware of. And uh, if there had been others, uh, Ms. Ripito or Mr. Vunich would have brought it to my attention. So unless my memory is failing me uh, and at my advanced age, that's always possible. Um, I'm not aware of any other complaints, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess, I mean, I will ask, does anybody want to make a motion? Does everybody just want to Thank Melanie for hard work and we'll just kind of like see where this takes us or like, do we just, I mean, we don't need a motion unless we want to move forward. Melanie, go ahead. You got your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I may, um, I would recommend at least putting in 
some safety precautions as far as not placing fences in the right of way um, or proximity to the street as far as front yard fences are concerned just for visibility. Um, there are a lot of long windy roads in in the city of Wildwood and if you have the fence too close to it, it might cause issues with visibility going around bends and such. So it might be worth considering um, putting in minimum safety precautions. St. Louis County um, doesn't regulate anything under six feet except for not allowing fences within a sight distance triangle, um, which is smart just so that you know people don't get into accidents unnecessarily. So that would be probably worth something looking into. Additionally, um, front yard fencing is one of the most commonly regulated things because you wouldn't want say a stockade fence or a seven foot tall fence necessarily in the front yard unless you know it was so many feet from the street. Um, and so those, those might be things that that you may want to take into consideration as well as, you know, the deer fencing, um, like the seven foot deer fencing. There are a lot of cities that allow uh, uh, garden fencing. Um, and a lot of that doesn't even necessarily require a permit if it's temporary garden fencing and not a permanent structure. Um, and so those are ways of working around the deer fencing without necessarily over-regulating, you know, without limiting types of fence and such, just limiting maybe heights or transparency through, you know, in the front yard. Um, that would be my only suggestions. Thank you, Melanie. And those are, those are, that, that was good suggestions and a good quick summary on that. Um, Joe, go ahead. Joe Farmer, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go ahead and make the motion as Melanie suggested that we can, you know, maybe draw some limited stuff up in terms of, you know, safety and, and, the front yard thing makes sense, I guess, in most places. So sort of as, uh, how would we want to do this? As staff suggested, just, you know, very limited safety and and precautionary legislation would be great. Okay. Thank you. And I got a second from Rob Rambo. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I guess, Melanie, you'll come back at our next committee meeting with some like a summary of some suggestions to move forward with that part, I guess. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. On the site visibility part of it, especially like you had mentioned on the windy roads, how is that? Like, do you know how that's determined? Generally, it's, it's not site specific. Um, generally, it's just you have to have your fence so many feet off of the property line or not located within a site distance triangle, which is essentially a triangle 30 feet, you know, from the intersection, you know, down 30 by 30 triangle. Um, so that visibility isn't, isn't an issue. And so we would probably include something to that extent. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So any other questions or discussion? So we have a motion on the floor. Ms. Cruz, you want to repeat the motion? It would just so we know what we're voting on, please. You are muted, sir. <clears throat> there you go. You're muted, Gary. Motion to consider limited fencing regulations dealing with safety precautions. Perfect. And I, do we need to have front yard or anything, or is that just going to encompass all of it? And the deer part. I mean, I, I kind of figured that we can start with this. It would just encompass all of it and whatever we come back with in terms of front yard Perfect. and all that, that. We'll just roll that into the next one. Perfect. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can do this on a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Melanie. Great presentation. Uh, next on the agenda is commercial vehicle definition and test period for such. This looks a little unique. Joe, go ahead, please. Well said, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, as you know, back in the early part of 2020, the pandemic started. And at that time, a lot of changes occurred, not only in home life, but how people went to work or didn't go to work and et cetera. At that time, the city council felt it was important to 
accommodate commercial vehicles in residential settings, including the non-urban residence district to help along with this pandemic kind of charged environment. Over the course of 2020, the committee worked on refining a commercial vehicle definition for the zoning ordinance that would be fair, but not harmful to residential areas, neighborhoods, et cetera. Ultimately, a, a definition was finalized and that definition is provided as part of the memorandum. When that was to be presented to city council, the city council was also very busy, not only with pandemic related items, but also the rural internet and its strategic planning process. And ultimately those priorities seem to exceed the other, the commercial vehicle definition, and ultimately it was delayed. At the end of that last year, 2021, the idea was to bring this matter back to the city council for consideration. Mr. Cross, Mr. Young and I had a conversation relating to the definition of commercial vehicles. And I believe it was Mr. Young that stated that in some instances due to the pandemic, other communities are doing a test period. What the test period allows is to see how it works before you memorialize changes that are often hard to resend. What it specifically does is allow the code enforcement component of the city to not enforce with the vigor of, uh, let's say, a normal day and allow things to kind of see how they play out. And then if we get complaints, we can log those complaints and bring them to the committee. If we don't and things seem to work, then we know we've got a pretty good situation in hand and the committee did a good job in refining the definition. So tonight, Mr. Cross, Mr. Young and I collectively are presenting to you what the chair has described as kind of an unusual approach, but it's one that again has been recommended by the city attorney and in some regards has been in practice um, over the last year since we completed the definition of commercial vehicles. We'd like to formalize it. You can set a time frame with it and then report back. And if all is good, then we can proceed forward. And if there are certain things we notice, we can refine and then proceed forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And did, um, before I get in, Teresa, I got you uh, next. Joe, did um, city attorney recommend this time period, like a year, or have other municipalities use a standard time, or is it just kind of like, let's just see what happens? I don't recall Mr. Young saying a three month or six month. Um, what I would suggest is at least through the pandemic, let's kind of monitor it from that perspective. Because again, remember, that was the primary reason this came up at city council was the pandemic and concerns by Dr. Remy, Mr. Bartoni and others about the impact that was having on that work from home component that now has become much more, I think, prevalent across the city of Wildwood, the metropolitan area and elsewhere. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Joe. Teresa, go ahead, please. Yeah, I still have, um one small concern with this definition, just um, before we go ahead with it, it's, it seems to me that parts of it might be very restrictive, more so than we mean for it to be. Um, it, it just, again, curb weight, if we measure the curb weight of the vehicle, that's just the vehicle without any passenger, with any occupants or cargo. Then the, the gross vehicular weight rating, that's the maximum weight of the vehicle of the curb weight plus the passengers plus the cargo in the vehicle. The um, curb, the gross vehicular weight rating with an empty trailer is just the, the gross vehicular curb rate weighting plus the trailer tongue, not even the, the weight of the trailer. But then the gross combined weight rating that he that we got also on our um, we've we've designated both of them, and the gross combined weight rating 
that is the curb weight plus all the occupants, all the cargo, the trailer, the tongue of the trailer, and the um, cargo of the trailer. So if your truck is um, weighs 7,000 pounds and is rated at being able to, to have a, a, a payload of 7,000 pounds, it's taking it over. Um, it's not a great huge truck, but the payload has made it by, by measuring the gross combined weight rating has made it a lot more. So these vehicles might not be as big a vehicle as, we, as we're thinking they are, saying that they, if they're over 10,500 pounds, I guess I would um, remove the gross combined weight rating or put that with a different sentence that says, you know, here's the rating that could be at 15,000 pounds or whatever it is that was decided on. But having that restriction, that would be a pretty small vehicle carrying its biggest load to be under 10,000 pounds. Do you see what I'm saying? I just am a little concerned that, that having that combined weight in there is going to um, possibly limit the um, businesses, maybe the people that are carrying their um, lawn equipment here and there on the back of their trailers. That's all. Well, Ms. Clark, I think the kind of test period would allow us to actually go out in the community, maybe take some photographs of different applications, kind of see what we're seeing the most of. Is, is it just a single pickup truck with commercial lettering on it, or is it a truck with trailer, or is it this, or is it that? Take photographs, kind of get an idea of what we're seeing out in the community. And then certainly when we come back at the conclusion of the test period, we can make amendments to the definition then. Thank you, Joe. Um, any other questions? So Joe, are you looking for a motion then to move forward with this test period? Yes, Mr. Chair. I believe the department would respectfully request that the test period be authorized or recommended for authorization for a period of not to exceed, let's say 10 months. Um, just because that puts us like right at the end of November, would you be okay with just like through 2021? Certainly, I um, I was just assuming maybe with the, like we did this year with the Christmas holiday and et cetera, we didn't have a meeting. So I was trying to avoid okay. that. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, does somebody want to make that motion? Made by council member Farmer. Do we have a second? Seconded by... Uh, Council Member Nyans, okay. So is there any discussion on the motion? Okay, and we'll see how this test period goes and hopefully Teresa's concerns are met because I have similar concerns. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. We have one opposition, Council Member Clark. Any, up, any abstain? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Joe. Mr. Chair, we'll give you some updates along the way so we're not kind of just pouring everything on you at the end of the year, so to speak. Thank you. And if, I mean, and just, just kind of as a sidebar, if I remember correctly, this was also just kind of like one or two resident complaints. I don't think we had like a citywide issue on this, if I remember correctly. It comes in spurts, Mr. Bartoni, but what prompted this more than anything, it wasn't complaints or not necessarily requests. It was just recognizing the pandemic was going to change the way things are done. Right. Thank you. Um, next thing on the agenda is the overview of recent development trends within the city of Wildwood. This is just 
Um, kind of an FYI that the mayor had asked staff to include in this committee meeting. Um, hopefully everybody's had a chance to review it. Does anybody have any questions for the department on anything? If not, we can just keep proceeding. Seeing none. Joe, I have one question and I can't remember which one it was, but there was one person, this is another kind of a sidebar thing. I guess a resident was putting a generator in their house. Uh, have we been seeing a lot of that by chance? And this is more just my own curiosity. Out in the rural areas, we see quite a few generator applications. Okay, thank you. Um, that takes us to park matters. Um, we have six of these. The first one, a presentation of consultants proposal for development of design and engineering plans for Village Green. Um, Melanie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, the last time the Village Green was brought before you, the department presented the proposed phase one of construction. Uh, in this, the department worked with human nature um, to determine the best way to utilize the limited funding currently budgeted for Village Green in a way that would create the best possible community space. Uh, the department has since requested a proposal from human nature uh, that is partnering with civil designing for a scope of work that would essentially include design services, construction documents, and consulting throughout the process. Their proposal uh, is before you tonight. It would get us from where we are now through construction of phase one and includes a proposed survey of the street addition in phase two. Additionally, the service also include a more accurate cost estimate which will help the city better plan construction and also includes construction administrative services throughout the bidding and construction uh, processes of the project. The proposal included um, shows the full scope of work uh, and the total cost associated with the scope of work is $192,575 inclusive of the optional phase two survey of the roadway extension. This is within the $200,000 the city has budgeted in 2022 for Village Green. If the city moves forward with this proposal, uh, they've estimated that construction documents will be prepared within about six months, allowing time for necessary approvals, bidding, permits. Um, construction could potentially be, uh, begin in 2023. The city currently has $700,000 budgeted in 2023 for Village Green and is in the process of two grant applications for up to $500,000 each. I believe both of them we should know um, in, by October whether they've been awarded. And this concludes our presentation. However, myself and Mr. Vunich are available for any questions you may have. I guess I need to unmute myself. Um, Melanie, what are you looking for from the committee tonight? Um, essentially, we're looking for approval to uh, move forward with the proposal um, for their services, which we would then take before the uh, council for approval. Okay, thank you. Deborah, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, Melanie, can, can you tell us a little bit more about the grants? Um, the grants, uh, currently um, we're working on the uh, land water grant that is for up to $500,000. It's due um, in February, I think February 15th. Um, Gary and I have been working on our submittal for that. And then we also have the municipal grant that uh, the application begins in June. And I think that both of them are awarded in October, if I'm not mistaken. And specifically, what are we looking for with those grants? Uh, for up to $500,000 in funding for per grant. So essentially we're looking for funding for the Village Green. So does it have certain parameters that we can yeah. utilize in the Village Green? And can you tell us a little bit about what those are? Um, I'm 
not exactly prepared for that question, but I think it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I mean, the, the one that I we're currently working on is, I mean, it's a book that we've prepared for. Um, but yes. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was just curious as to exactly how that was going to fit into our project and it was designated for just certain areas, certain types, um, or, or whatever. So yeah, no. they're I both think. park grants. So essentially they, you know, are, are awarded for either, you know, um, maintaining parks or for establishing new parks. Okay. And then my, um, other question is, um, on, uh, page two, 1.5, it mentions a public meeting and visualization to be held. So I don't recall us doing that, but I do know we had something on Zoom. Um, are we going to have a public meeting? And if so, is there a date? Is that going to be um, in person or virtual? Um, if I may. Um... So as far as the public meeting is concerned, uh, I mean, I believe that that's including coming to city council and presenting on the project once it's completed. Um, and so, I mean, that would depend on, you know, whether meetings are being held live or virtual. Um, and so that, that would be dependent upon that. So it's specifically for council and not the general public? Uh, I believe so. I can verify that. Um, I know that in meetings, you know, I mean, sometimes I feel like the public was involved in the design process. I don't know that this is, is necessarily part of that, but I can confirm. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it all possible, um, my preference would be to have the public involved in it. Um, I don't know if it, we need a public hearing on this or whatever, but um, I know by going through the neighborhood park process um, that even though residents were involved along the way, um, they were interested in seeing the finished project before we moved ahead on it. So sure. if, if that's possible, that would be my preference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Dan, I've got you next, but Gary, you have your hand up, I guess, to answer part of Deborah's question. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I might be simplifying this a whole lot, but the, the initial grant that Melanie's working on right now that we've, that we've been working on, that's for strictly the phase one development of, of the, the village green, which is basically the foundation uh, that, will, that will lead way to the, to the rest of the development in the future. It's kind of a time sensitive um, uh, development because we need, we need the space for our bigger events because we're losing the, the area out here just east of the B&B &B theater. So what phase one is going to do, it's going to line out the village green, set the foundation so that we have a place to have our, our concerts and, and the celebrate Wildwood event and stuff like that. There will be no actual structures built, just the foundation of the village green. Thank you, Gary, for clarifying that. Um, Dan, go ahead, please. I want to make the motion to, to move this forward. I'm super excited about this. Okay, we have a motion on the floor, seconded by Council Member Rambo. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, I think we could do this by a voice vote also. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everybody. And Dan, I agree. I'm excited about this. This is great. And Melanie, great presentation again. Yeah, um, and it was a great job on the value engineering. Um, uh, and the, you're driving the price down um, without taking out any any meaningful uh, features and preparing for future work and so forth. It's a really good job. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Joe Farmer, I see your hand up. Yeah, uh, this is, I think, maybe a little bit involved in this. I don't know if we need to worry, start worrying about it now or not, but um, we do have a few little development projects that are coming up kind of in that general vicinity. And so it may not be a bad idea to look into, I don't know if it would be like a waiver or something like that. I know Chesterfield's got a waiver for the airport because people get upset about the noise, but some of those homes that are being built over there and obviously some of the neighbors that have been there for quite a while, as we move over into that neck of the woods from where we're normally at and build that process out, we probably want people to know ahead of time what's going on there so that once we get it all put in they're not like what it, i didn't agree to live next to an amphitheater what is going on um we might want to head that off at the pass 
Yes, sir. Probably a good suggestion. Thank you, Joe. Okay, next thing on the agenda is the discussion of the 2022 recreation event schedule. Gary and Joe for this one. Go ahead, guys. Well, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, as has been practiced for many, many years, in anticipation of the upcoming year, the recreation event schedule is presented to the committee for endorsement. And tonight, Mr. Cruz will identify the major events. That's not inclusive of all the events, but the major events we have planned for 2022 and seek your input. Gary? Uh, sure, it's pretty simple. Uh, we're, what we do is we, we're putting down the events that we know we can do with the adjustments that need to be made for the current COVID situation. Uh, the first one is the Frozen Feet um, Half Marathon, which takes place this Saturday, by the way. Um, we've had a good response, given even given the, the pandemic situation, we'll have about 150 people taking to the uh, taking to the trails out there. But we have limited the uh, large gatherings that are typically associated with the uh, Frozen Feet event, so, um, like eliminating the pizza pizza buffet we usually have and the award ceremony and everything out like that to limit the large gatherings. Uh, the egg hunt, we thought we were going to move forward with our traditional egg hunt, but once again, we're going to revert back to the drive through egg hunt that we had last year, which was very successful, by the way. And we can do with a, a limited amount of staff, and we don't have a large gathering involved with the event like we typically have for these spring egg hunts. If you're familiar with that event, well, we usually have, you know, a thousand people running around shoulder to shoulder. The plain air event is self-explanatory. Everything's outside. It's not a large gathering at all. People go out, do their artwork. They come back, they turn their artwork in. Uh, and we, we do this all without gathering in large groups. All the music on main concerts this year have all been scheduled. Uh, they're all, everybody, everything's already under contract. Um, everything's outside. Uh, we'll just await further guidance from our city administrator and city council and on whether we have to make adjustments with those events. Uh, the, the ninth annual Celebrate Wildwood event is under full planning mode right now. And then we've been starting, we've been discussing that and Celebrate Wildwood Commission. Um, we have no contracts in place with that yet, but arrangements are, are underway. The Tour to Wildwood, um, it's still a question mark right now, but the Missouri Biking Federation has already reached out to us to, to see if we are if we are going to organize that again, that event once again in 2022. And I hope we are. Uh, but again, that involves a large gathering at the registration and um, uh, dispensing of T-shirts and check in points and the starting of, of the of the ride. And then there's also a large gathering at the end of that event where we have a large lunch or a barbecue or whatever at the end. So we have to enter, we have to discuss that further before we make any final commitments with it. And then of course, the last event of the year that we definitely are gonna have is the Shivering Shadows 7K, which has proven very popular in the last two years that we've had that. Um, and once again, if if by October we can we can gather a little more closely, it'll be a lot more fun. Otherwise we'll do it in a similar fashion that we're doing with the uh, Frozen Feet Run this Saturday. And I'm available for any questions if you have any. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, Teresa, I see, or Tracy, I see your hand up, and Joe, I got you next. Dan, you after that. Okay, this is just a really simple question. This looks like a great schedule. Is music on Maine is traditionally on Friday? Sorry, she cut out. One on June 18th, potentially on a Saturday night. Oh, sorry. We lost you, My Tracy. Yeah. Tracy, we lost you. If you can repeat it, please. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. It's my internet. It goes in and out. Um, I think this looks like a great schedule. Um, I know the music on Maine is traditionally on Friday nights. Is there a reason the one on June 18th is on a Saturday night? I mean, I don't have any problem with it. I just wanted to see if that was what was intended. Oh, I, I will defer to Joe. They, we've always had them on Friday evenings. Okay, I think because doesn't it say June 18th? And June 18th is a Saturday, so it just might be a typo or something. Just Diane, I believe that's a typo. Okay, I just wanted to check. Thank you. And we'll verify though, make sure we don't have the band booked for a Saturday when we think they'll be here on a Friday. Yeah. 
Okay, Joe Farmer, go ahead. Dan, I got you after that, and then Deborah. Yeah, uh, this is a great schedule. Thanks for putting it together, guys. I, I, it's maybe not something we've ever done. I can't remember, but um, obviously this year we had our holiday event that had some cost overruns, which I know is normally put on by you know the WBA, but um, is that something that is separate from all of this stuff? Are we steering away from doing that? I'm just trying to figure out like our, our schedule, you know, stops at the end of October and there's at least one other big event that usually goes on throughout the year. Um, Gary, is that for you or is that for Mr. Cross? I, I, I was going to let Mr. Cross answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, with regards to the budget uh, and the overruns that we had a discussion as recent as last night, um, the cost overruns for the tree lighting ceremony, uh, that was a 2021 event. Those costs uh, will go into the, as I mentioned uh, at council, that'll be a budget adjustment for 2021 in the economic development, in the economic development department's budget. So that's with regards to that. As far as the schedule goes, um, and again, um, I'll defer to Gary, but I don't think that they stopped the schedule at October because of any budget issues. Um, the, you know, there, as, as Mr. Vunich mentioned at, at, the, at, as, at his part, uh, this is not everything. These are just the major events, but there are many other events uh, that aren't, aren't listed here. Um, and so, yes, there'll be, you know, the tree lighting ceremony in December, but again, it would be anticipated. Well, it, the expectation will be that um, uh, we won't have the situation in 2022 that we did in 2021. So um, I suspect that maybe that's not why that that's why that's not on here, but there's, there's quite a few smaller events. I mean, there's a whole lot of events throughout the year that aren't listed here, but it right. is not, it's not, a, it's not, it doesn't show because of a budget issue. Okay. But that's, that's fine. I just, I figured, you know, I, I know I was very aware of a lot of the issues that were going on with that while they were happening. So I thought perhaps if we, I didn't know if we were going to take a heavier hand in that or, or roll the dice, so to speak, as we did last year. Well, I can, well, the one thing I can say is yes, we're going to take a much heavier hand in making sure that those cost overruns do not occur in 2022. Awesome. All right. That's all I got. Right. And Thank the, you. and the June. Um, Dan, the June go ahead, please. And Deborah, I got you next. Oh, Gary, I'm sorry, Gary, go ahead. I was, I was just going to verify the, the concert in June is Gary? June 17th. Oh, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, Dan, go ahead, please. And then Deborah, I got you next. Yeah. My, my question, and just cause I don't know, when did we have to, decide to um, make the egg hunt more COVID accessible last year? Like, do we have the potential to wait longer to make that decision or do you guys need to make that decision now just so you can plan accordingly? Mr. Flasher, I think we have some flexibility, not a whole lot, but I think we're being cautious, not knowing what the future holds, but I'd like to think at the very least, we may be able to swing over to a more traditional setting if the COVID numbers allow and do it hopefully sometime in mid -fe February or um, late February. So you still have the potential to switch back to the traditional way if COVID allows us to do so. All right, that's we have, we have the facilities reserved uh, at Fairway Elementary and everything, right? Wonderful. Thank you. Deborah, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, uh, the chairs of the standing budget committee was working really hard on the events and to um, make them as cost effective as possible. And I was just wondering, has anything changed recently or did they remain the same? Uh, Ms. McCutcheon, we actually deleted the two events that the program budget committee had identified, those major events, the 5K and the in the April timeframe, and then the winter event at Hidden Valley Ski Resort. And we also this past fall implemented the charges for the early childhood recreation program. So where we can, we've been doing it just to kind of uh, follow the direction of the <coughs> committee chairs, and that'll eventually become more formalized. 
Thank you, Deborah. Is that answer for you? Okay, thank you. So, Gary, Joe, do you need a motion? I mean, we really don't need a motion for this, I wouldn't think, or we do need a motion to move forward with the schedule. Yes, Mr. Chair, it's been tradition that the committee makes an endorsement of the schedule by motion. Okay, we can do that. Do I, I get a motion from Mr. Farmer, seconded by Council Member Flasher. Um, any discussion? We can probably do this on a voice. I think you cut out Don, at least for me. We lost you, Don. Okay, sorry about that. So we have a motion on the floor to move forward with the schedule. And we have a second by Council Member Flasher. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sorry about the pretty interruption. Um, Next on the agenda is the update and discussion of the Hardcourt area and community park. Mr. Boonich. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, as you know, the committee has been pursuing the installation of pickleball courts in one of the city facilities. And over the course of that conversation, community park was selected and a location on the Southern tip of the Great Meadow area was identified as most suitable. The committee also thought that three of the pickleball courts would be most appropriate. And ultimately the location and the design of those was identified in a very preliminary concept. Tonight you have a more refined concept for you that now includes some very um, uh, preliminary surveying, surveying work at the location to ensure that the design would be accommodated. That survey work indicated that the original desire to have the courts in the opposite direction actually a, a created some grade issues and added expense due to the need for engineered solutions. So what you see tonight is a more north-south orientation of the court areas versus an east-west. Additionally, you can see how Generally speaking, they can be multi-purpose uh, court areas. They can be striped for basketball. They can be striped and uh, designed for tennis as well as pickleball. And so what the park designer has done is kind of laid that out to kind of give you a perspective of what that all looks like when put on paper. I would note that the cost associated with the installation of these, according to the park designer is going, it has skyrocketed. And um, we had budgeted 100,000 this year and 100,000 next year. And we may need a little more money if we intend to do three of these. So tonight we're presenting this in concept with better information and a slight change to the orientation and with uh, discussion the department would seek an endorsement so that we can proceed to the next step, which is more of the design and engineering to basically prepare bid documents so that we can actually see what the cost might be. No, oh, by the way, the one thing that's causing the skyrocketing prices, the cost of asphalt. Yeah, materials, yeah, asphalt's expensive right now. Um, Dan, go ahead, please, and Deborah, I got you next. Full endorsement here. I want to push it forward. I want to be the one making that motion, please. All right, fair enough. Um, do we have a second? All right, got a second from Deborah. And Deborah, did you want to say something as well? Yeah, I just have a question because I know we discussed a lot about um, a volleyball court. So I didn't see that in this memorandum. Are we going to be able to use the services that we're putting in? For a volleyball court as well, or what happened with that plan? Ms. McCutcheon, like Steve, I'm a little older than most of you, so I may have to give a claim memory, but I think we were trying to do basketball, tennis, and pickleball. I will go back to the park designer and ask him if it's feasible to add another component 
or if we need to do just maybe a separate sandlot uh, volleyball court? I think, um, I know the residents have been looking for a sandlot volleyball court for many, many years, and I would definitely um, support coming back with a proposal for a uh, sand volleyball court. Thank you, Deborah. Dan, I saw your hand up, and Rob, I got you next. Yeah, I was just saying, I knew it was supposed to be sand and not a hard court surface, not on this type of surface. And I would think it'd be something maybe close by that, but not replacing any of the space that we're using here for the hard courts. Thank you, Dan. Rob, go ahead, please. Yeah, that, that was exactly the thought. Um, I think I initially suggested it um, somewhere closer to the pavilions, perhaps something like that, because uh, families go there and um, they're looking for something to do after they've eaten the potato salad and the hot dogs. And um, it's, um, it's, uh, re it would be a really cheap uh, way to add a, a, a nice amenity to, um, to some area close to one of the pavilions. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Tracy, go ahead, please. I just have a question that's getting way ahead of all this because I'm 100% in favor of this. And then I'm thinking when I go to play pickleball there, everywhere I play, I have to reserve a court. Is this going to be a reservation kind of thing, like a pavilion rental would be or a reservation? And I'm, again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We don't have to answer this question tonight. I just see that could be an issue down the road where somebody plays pickleball for three hours while everybody else is sitting there or, you know, Somebody hogs the basketball in place for the whole day. I, I just want to make it not be an issue once we get this great amenity that people aren't still, you know, disappointed because they can't use it. Good question, Tracy. Joe, go ahead, Dan. I got you next. Well, if Mr. Flash would like to go first, I'll defer my answer to Mr. Nyan's question until he's complete. Yeah, I was just going to say at Bluebird Park, they have a sign that says if somebody's waiting to keep it down until like an hour. I would think we'd have something similar. I mean, we can't obviously enforce it necessarily, but you would hope people would respect that rule that you keep it to an hour if someone's waiting for you. Okay, Joe. And Mr. Chair, I think what we'll do as if this motion is favorable tonight by the committee and then city council concurs, we'll contact some of the other municipalities that have facilities where they facilities like this and how they handle reservations or how they handle the use of them over the course of a day. So when we come back prior, probably prior to the, the, the more engineered plans, we'll have something for you to kind of give you some insights. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Mr. Cross, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, We'll have some conversations internally about the reservation. I would simply note to um, the committee and, and to Mr. Vunich, um, let's proceed cautiously with regards to having reservations go through the city. Um, Mr. Flasher was correct in terms of typically for outdoor courts, um, it's kind of on the honor system and, and people being nice. My concern, I, and I want to, and again, it'll, it'll fall within Joe's department. So I'm trying to protect him from himself by saying, agreeing to everything um, in that um, if people start making reservations, now that takes, you know, and we, and we have a, you know, we have a, a, an automated system for, for doing certain things, but also the problem that creates problems if people are not, are showing up and, and there's a reservation made and somebody else is on the court. Now, who's going to enforce that uh, and make those people leave the court because somebody else says, I have a reservation and you got those kinds of problems. And then they start coming back to the city and saying, I had a reservation and now we got city staff trying to deal with those kinds of issues. Um, having a reservation system for an open outdoor court, um, I'd say let's be very, very careful how we do that and, and um, because it, it'll create a lot of headaches for the city. Just, just my two cents worth. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Well said. <laughs> That's a good two cents. And um, since our last committee meeting, and I never heard of pickleball till Deborah mentioned it like five or six years ago, I've actually played. And uh, it was down in Florida and like they actually had a, on the fence, like a, like a place to hold the paddles. And this might be what they have at Bluebird, but it was kind of like you just had your paddle on a slot and it just got closer to going next and you had an hour 
it was kind of like if you remember the pool tables where you put your quarters it's just when your quarters came up it was your turn to play so um hopefully it'll work out so if there's no other questions we do have a motion on the floor to proceed and go to the next step and get to the bid process i think we can do this with a voice vote also all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed any abstentions Great. Looking forward to the next step. Looking forward to this opening. I think I did hear Rob say that he would barbecue hot dogs and bring potato salad for everybody. So I think we're going to look for that and look forward to that as well. Uh, next thing on our agenda is the presentation of proposal for fence replacements along Wildwood um, Greenway Corridor. Um, this is for Gary and Joe. Go ahead. Well, unfortunately, somebody stole some of our fence. Surprisingly, it's not easy to steal either. So Gary's undertaken the process to see how we can replace it. So I'm gonna let him explain what he's been doing. Uh, so what happened is they stole 12 sections of the, of the fence, which is above the bicycle pedestrian bridge, which is the, 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 the Eastern portion of highway 100 by the mobile station there. We got, we got estimates for, uh, we reached out to three different companies for estimates. And while we were waiting for those estimates, they came back and they stole a total of 21 pieces of fence. So right now the, the fence, the blanks, uh, the holes in the fence are, are covered with uh, orange snow fence that Glenn Gailey put up for us. And uh, we reached out to Fence and Dex Depot, Cheshfield Fence and Deck and Outdoor Living Incorporated for estimates. Fence and Dex Depot came back to us and said they couldn't do it. They couldn't match the fence. Uh, Chesterfield Deck and Fence came back and said they could replace the fence, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't match the current fencing that's, that's remaining. And Outdoor Living Incorporated said that they could replace the fence. If it's not exactly what's there, it's darn close. Uh, the least expensive bid obviously came from Chesterfield Fence and Deck, which Joe uh, originally uh, recommended. Uh, and I'm not here to, I, I'm not, I'm not reaching out for any one particular, but I just want to make note that Outdoor Living Incorporated, while they're more expensive, they were more responsive uh, and, and they jumped right on top of things for us. So anyway, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And Joe and I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um... Teresa, go ahead. Joe Farmer, I got you next. Thank you, Chair, but I believe that Mr. Cross had something first. Um, I'll defer to the committee members for their questions. I just wanted to add uh, something uh, that on top of what Gary had said, but I'll, I'll hold my comments till after you all have had your questions answered. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair, if I could go ahead. Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cruz, my question is that what is the what is the substrate that the fence is made out of now? It, it says wrought iron. Is it wrought iron? Wrought iron? Or... It's an aluminum fencing. It's an aluminum fixing now. Okay, yes, because I was looking through these and they were the, the material that they, they use is aluminum, it looks like. So I just thought... Right. That the the it looked like the verbiage was talking about um, it's a rod iron, and then we were going to aluminum. That was a concern I had, but that clears that up. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Farmer. Go ahead, please. Uh, I, I was actually going to make the motion to, um, even though it's more expensive, to go with the bid that kind of more closely matches what we've got because it's a relatively prominent place up there on the hill, and the orange is kind of. Odd looking at honestly, I didn't even know that was our fence. I just figured that that was something that the Schnooks people had. But um, I would also be curious, like, what if anything can we do to maybe stop people from stealing the fence? <laughs> do we need to put like a camera or something? Like, I don't know that that's that doesn't look like something that would be a quick job to get 21 sections of a fence out without anybody noticing. So, um, do we have a plan for that? Uh, what, what we determined was who, whoever is doing it. that area above the pedestrian bridge, as you might guess, is once it gets dark, you don't see anything moving up there at all. Right. And what people what they were doing was they were coming in on, on one particular evening. They were loosening all the nuts and bolts 
and then they would come back in a different evening. They would just pick up the sections of fences and throw them on their truck and our trailer, and, and they would disappear. Um, what, what they have done, what the police have done since then is they have set up cameras uh, all around the area. And uh, since the cameras have been set up, obviously, we, we've had no, no movement up there at all. Well, that's good. All right. Well, I mean, I, you know, I think trying to get that to match as close as we can is, is probably more important than saving a couple dollars, especially if we can actually get it done. Um, Mr. Vunich, go ahead, please. Rob, I got you next. Just one thing to add in response to Mr. Farmer's question. We also have asked uh, Glenn Gailey, Gailey Contracting, to find a better set of screws that maybe require a special type of screwdriver or drill bit so that it's not as easy as it appears to be. Thank you. Rob, go ahead, please. Well, uh, saws all cut through the aluminum like butter, and if they're doing it for scrap or something, that's probably not going to help much. But um, I'm just disgusted by this. Um, I. I wanted to rant for a second, but uh, to, uh, in a more productive vein, um, did the police have any leads or anything like that? Or are they doing any sort of an investigation or, or um, is it just not worth messing with because the cost is ultimately trivial? That's one question. And then the other thing, Gary, is, um, is the, um, the more expensive solution. Those are the folks, it's the, the same folks that you liked are the um, providing the fence that looks most like the old fence? Is that true? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and the and the police have they they did get a couple of pictures of vehicles moving around in there, but unfortunately they couldn't get the license plates. They have since moved moved the cameras to better get those license plates. Um, and it's obviously they weren't stealing this for scrap because they took care to remove all the nuts and bolts. Uh. Yeah, and, and then and they left the fence in place, and then they came back later and just picked the section up very quickly and, and left. Uh, they do have detectives following up on this, but there's really no way to identify those missing pieces of fence once they're reinstalled someplace else. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. All right, well, thanks. It's just disheartening. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, Mr. Cross, did you have your hand up as well, please? I did. Thank you. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> um, I was, in fact, going to ask uh, Gary to expound on his answer uh, because there um, um, had been some uh, other information with regards to how we were trying to prevent it. So that's been covered in terms of the police cameras. Uh, I, I especially wanted, wanted to point out about the, uh, the nuts and bolts that we were looking for a, um, a better way. Um, I, you know, to try to um, slow things down, if not prevent the sex, the stealing. But again, um, as uh, Mr. Rambo pointed out, a sol a sol all will go through that that aluminum pretty darn quick. The other thing is when when you asked if there was um, anything that uh, is being done for the investigation, Joe and Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, a tool was left behind. Is that not correct? So yes, sir. So, and the reason I bring that up and I'm going to smile a little bit because we all lost a very, very good patrol officer um, in uh, Jamie Ryder, okay? Uh, who was, uh, you know, just a great asset to the city. Uh, Jamie took this personally. Uh, and so Jamie took that leftover tool and man, she was going, I, I mean, she wanted to go and, and personally find that person and, and beat them over the head with that tool. <laughs> So uh, she was doing everything she could, and she wanted to contact the FBI, the Secret Service, and everybody else to try to run prints on that tool and everything. But ultimately, it, it didn't go anywhere. But I'll tell you what, she was a dog with a bone with that tool and, and the prints, the latent prints that might have been left on that tool. It was kind of funny, but unfortunately, well, that... Well, that we let... Go ahead. We laugh at that. We laugh at that, Mr. Cross, but she did. Uh, and and the, the Department of Identification, they did... They are running DNA analysis on those, on those tools that were left behind to see if they can come up with anything. So, <laughs> so we're running, that's awesome. We're, we're running DNA, and and now if somebody's not in the system, that may not uh, lend anything. But that just gives an idea of what what she wanted to do. So um, I think uh, you know, somehow you know perhaps using um, one way bolts or ones that take a, a hex head or some special tool or something perhaps might slow things down. But at the end of the day, it's pretty, it's pretty low life, uh, you know, to come and do that. So thank yeah. you, Mr.
you're you're welcome a lot of times you're doing those stuff just to keep the honest people honest um i, I agree with i got one question i agree with uh joe farmer it, you know it's a very visible part of the city it's a trail that gets used a lot i think we should try to make it look as good as we do um the bid that came from chesterfield deck that was three thousand dollars less I mean, is it close, like where you would notice because you know there's a difference or is everybody just going to notice the difference? Well, what they have to do is they have to move the existing fence, pieces of fence and, and, and put it at one end so that this new fence can be put in there. If, if they try to install the pieces as, as the fence stands right now, you would definitely notice that it's different. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff, I kind of like, take back a little bit, make it personal. If it was your backyard, would you make it match? Okay. okay. So we do have a motion on the floor. Um, I think Joe Farmer made the motion or was it Dave, Joe? But we didn't get a second. So we do need a second. Uh, got a second from council member Rambo. Uh, any other discussion? So I think the motion was to move forward with outdoor living correct which will match is the most yeah the one that matches closest, most closely correct i think Deb, deb's got something she would like to yeah, add deborah, perhaps. yeah deborah i see your hand up so yeah, it's, that's it's the most basically a question so gary just said they um have removed 21 sections is i i can't <clears> remember off the top of my head is that what was in the memorandum or is this going to cost us additional funding or the the estimates are based on those 21 pieces of fence right thank you any other questions for the department okay so all those in favor of moving forward with the motion please say aye aye, aye. any opposed any abstentions all right thank you very much everyone um, next on our list is an um, uh, update on in-person and virtual recreation program. We can kind of take these next two together. The next one after that is the facilities reservation and event registrations. These are kind of FYI events, no actions needed, as, uh, if I remember correctly. Does anybody have any questions for the department on either one of those two? All right, fair enough. So that takes us to our executive session uh, matter. So we will need a roll call vote to go into executive session and then we'll give the department time to get us off of YouTube. So I need a motion to go into executive session. Okay, I think I just froze up. Okay, uh, maybe member Farmer seconded by council member Clark. Um, we need a roll call vote on this. Mr. Cruz. Councilmember Clark. Yes. Councilmember Nyan. Yes. Councilmember Farmer. Yes. Councilmember McCutcheon. Yes. Councilmember Rambone. Yes. Councilmember Flasher. Yes. And Chair Bartoni. Yes. Okay, so we'll give the department a moment to 